the book of Romans, chapter 3. Father, we ask that you would bless your word. And Lord, whether uh, people are out celebrating um, the gift of fatherhood, Lord, or here with us celebrating, God, we ask that you would bless them. Bless your word, and God, keep continue, Lord, we ask to mold us in the image of your son. Amen. All right, so a number celebrating Father's Day. You know, Ephesians says, uh, reminds us of the, the first commandment, to honor your father and your mother, and it'll be well with you, and you'll have long life on the earth. So, you know, rather than getting excited about eating organic, you might just start with honoring your father today. It'll be a good start for some long life and, and blessing. <clears throat> Romans chapter 3. So we're, we're going to transition into a new section today. Um, we, I kind of gave this outline a couple weeks ago where Paul starts out with the salutation, says hi to the Roman church. And then he goes in from verse 1-8 to 3-20 and talks about sin and the fact that we are all come short before God. Now we're going to transition into a section where he begins to speak on salvation. And of course later we'll get into sovereignty and service. But for now, of salvation. As God has pointed out, the man in the bush, the intellect, the Jew, everybody has been come up short, utterly failed. So how does a God, a just God, justify ungodly sinners? How does God do that? You know, there was an old, there was an old uh, pastor one time. He came into his office and sat down and just sighed and said, You know, Lord, I feel completely unworthy to come into your presence. I haven't shared your word today. This is, you know, I haven't prayed other than this today. I, haven't, haven't, I just haven't done anything. And the Lord really spoke to his heart and said, If you'd let a thousand people to the Lord, would you be any more worthy to come into my presence? And the answer is, is no. And the Lord has exhausted that point for the last chapter and half that we are not worthy to come to him. And there is no amount of law keeping or good deeds or anything that we can do to earn that, to gain that, to come into his presence, to be right with him. All of our righteousness is just this little filthy rag before a mountain of righteousness and not worthy to be compared so we come to this section of how, how God does this, what his plan has been to make ungodly sinners, which he loved, right with him. <clears throat> um, we're going to see the, the blessing of his plan and how great and gracious our God is, and that he had this in mind from Adam when he said, hey, I'll crush the serpent's head. Not you. I'll do that. And he had it in mind when he was calling Abraham out. And he had it in mind when he gave the law and the purpose of leading us to Christ and how great and wonderful our God is. And he's going to really bring a lot of these things to light in the next couple chapters. So Romans chapter 3, we'll start in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So it's revealed. The, the righteousness of God is now made perfectly manifest. You can see it for yourself with your eyes. And it was testified of by the law and the prophets, completely in harmony. Faith and works are completely in harmony. Law and grace are completely in harmony in the plan of God. Verse 22, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God puts out there his universal invitation, his universal salvation for anyone who will believe to all and on all who believe. And then he says, look, in my justice, there is 
equality. You're all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There's no special attention for the rich. No special attention for the poor. There's no special attention for the wise or for the fool. Because everybody has missed the mark. In James chapter 2, verse 10, he makes clear that if you stumble in one point in the law, that you are guilty of breaking the entire law. Completely guilty before God. So though in our comparing, in our self-righteousness, we may look around and say, you know, well, at least I'm better than that guy, or I'm better than this guy, and I haven't lied as much, or I do a good job. God says, yes, but one day, if you were to appear in my court, you would be just as guilty. And the righteousness of God is going to be revealed in the fact that out of that, out of that depravity, out of that infinite gap between unrighteous sinners and a holy God, he's going to show himself. Verse 24, being freely justified through his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, who God set forth as a propitiation by his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the time, at this present time his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of those who has faith in Jesus. So in God's perfect plan, he makes it abundantly clear that he does not wink at sin. He doesn't just dismiss it, but he will deal with it. And in that... As we've looked in the last couple chapters, that, that God is serious about sin. But now as we transition to salvation, as we begin to make that transition, in verse 24 it says, but justified freely by his grace. The word freely there it really brings out and indicates that from, from our side, there was no cause for him to do it. He justified it freely. There was no reason, there was no oh my goodness, that person is so great, I think I'm going to justify these guys. The, the idea behind it is that when he freely gave, it was because it was all from him. It was from his heart. For God so loved the world. Not that the world was pretty good, so we better invest something in it. But he freely gave his grace to us. And through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Now, Romans has a lot of big words that are, that are pretty theological and have all these ramifications and kind of spiderweb out through the entire Bible. And so we'll try to define some of them as we go. We don't want to do too many at once, or that's all we do for the next while. But uh, justification, I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but justification, as we move forward, to keep in your mind, the most simple definition we've ever been given for it is just as if I'd never sinned. Many of you guys have heard that term before. When God justified you freely, he made you just as though you had never sinned. But it's a little bit deeper than that. I might throw this in, though, for those of you who have heard this before. It's not the same as to acquit or to simply get them out of the judgment that was coming. Um, but it also has this implication that with it, comes imputed righteousness. Imputed is another term we'll get to soon. It basically is a numeric accounting. So that when God justified freely us freely by his grace, he also put in our account Jesus' righteousness. When God declared us righteous and justified us, he didn't tell a lie and say, well, you know, James actually had something going good on, and he's He's righteous. But no, he justified me by Christ. And in my account, he put as righteous. So that is a judicial term. He could declare us righteous. And it says by his blood, understanding the cost of what it was to make that happen. Another word before we move on is propitiation. In the Old Testament, propitiation was covering basically meant covering. Uh, it was the word for the mercy seat that sat upon the ark that 
that inside of it had the Ten Commandments and, and things. Um, it was a covering. In the New Testament, it basically means to satisfy, to, um, to fully pay for the, the justice of God. What I, I think is a great illustration of that it was shared with me a number of years ago is that when, when NASA sends up a, um, a spacecraft, it started with the Apollo um, and on their new Orion one, they've also installing one. It's called a propitiatory shield. My tongue might stumble a little bit on that. And so that when, the, when it goes up, and the astronauts do their thing, and the one, the Orion, that they're now preparing, they're hoping to send to Mars or to an asteroid. But eventually they got to come home. And when they come home and they're coming into our atmosphere much faster than a bullet leaving the end of your gun, there is a tremendous amount of force and heat that will be coming against it. And you guys know from your experience in life that if one of those pieces or part of that shield isn't complete, everybody dies. Um, and so this shield must be in place to be able to take the heat as they re-enter the atmosphere. And in verse 25, it says, Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ and he justifies us, we are now in the Father's hand. We are in Christ. And he is the one that in him, the, the justice of God, the the heat of his judgment, if you will, we are protected from. He is the one who is able to do that, to absorb it, to take, to satisfy, to not be overtaken by the judgment and the justice of God. And in him we are safe. And just like those astronauts, if you think you stand, if you think you're anything of yourself, put your arm out the window. <laughs> see how long it lasts as you're re-entering. And in that we also see to us... Um, and as God has proven in chapter 2 and 3, that we don't have anything of ourselves. And so as we fully trust, and the faith that God is going to be talking about here is that complete and utter reliance on the Lord Jesus Christ for as our only hope of salvation, our only hope for heaven, our, just our only hope. And so we, we stay inside of him as he is that covering, that pro propitiation for us. All right, so lots of definitions I think we're ready to plow on. Um, I probably better. Verse 26, the just and justifier. Before we move on, God in his plan and to demonstrate what kind of character and nature that our God has. See, there can be no mercy apart from justice. And God says, I am just and I am holy. And so he is the just. But in Christ, he is also the justifier. When we could not come to him, he came to us. When we had a gulf that we couldn't step over or had that heat that we could not take, God says, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. So he is the just and the justifier. Verse 27, where is the boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. We, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish it. Now, Paul in his ministry, as he would go around um, into Europe and through the Middle East, he would always go to, typically, he would always go to the synagogue first because he said that the, it was because the promises and things were made to the Jews that we should go to the Jew first and also to the Greek, also to the Gentile. And Paul loved the Jewish community. Later, we'll see in the book of Romans that he said, if it was possible for these guys to get saved or God to pour out his spirit um, as he is among the Gentiles, I'd, I'd be a curse from Christ. God loved 
the Jewish community. Paul loved the Jewish community, and he spent a ton of time with them. So I think not only being a Pharisee and probably spending most of his life arguing, um, if, you can, if you need an illustration, you probably just spend some time with your, with your teenager. It's kind of like being around the Pharisees. But they spend all their time arguing and trying to figure out how to get out of or to establish or have somebody else get in trouble. Um, he understood the arguments. He knew the point of view. He knew the questions that were going to be asked. And so he anticipates them as he begins to show the justification through faith. And he says, you know, therefore, where's the boasting then? Where do you get to, as, you know, in Jesus' time, they would they blow their horns and let everybody know that they're going to pray and make sure everybody sees when they give and so that they can see how righteous they are. And they find out that all of that was, all of that was for naught. The law was to lead them to Christ, not to give themselves reason to boast. And he says, and it's not for the Jew only, but for the Gentile. In chapter 4, now that he's given the statement that we shall only be justified by God through faith, he's going to begin to give some examples to um, show them from the scriptures and from how God has worked throughout the ages that this has been God's plan all along. It's not a new movement or a new sect, but it is God's plan that it goes this way. It was God's plan at the perfect time for Christ to come. It's God's plan to, to bring justification by faith through the, to the Gentiles and to the Jews. And so as he anticipates this argument in verse four, or chapter 4, verse 1, he says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has founded has found according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but debt. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, Paul clearly states that we are saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves, it is the gift of God and not of works so that absolutely no one can boast. And when we stand before God, we will have no boast except for that we know the Lord, that we have trusted in Jesus. And here Paul is illustrating it for the Romans as well. So, I mean, could you imagine if you were getting your family all excited for Christmas and on Christmas Eve, you know, you've, you've spent your time together, or you worship the Lord, whatever, and you, you get there, and, and your little eight-year-old comes walking out and brings out their change jar and says, here, what in the world are you doing? Well, I just wanted to pay for what I'm going to get in the morning. Well, I, I, think you, I, think, I think, son, you've kind of got that backwards. This is a gift. This is to remind us of God's gift and God's grace. Well, no, 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 I want, I want to do something for it. And you see how quickly, I mean, it seems silly because then it would no longer be a gift. It wouldn't be Christmas gifts. It would just be, hey, I'm selling my kids Christmas on, or presents on the 25th, which sounds somewhat appealing over the last few years. Because <laughs> their presents get more expensive as they get older. But it's either a gift or it's wages. And if you have done anything, if there is anything that you could have done, if there was a law that you could keep to make you right with God, it would no longer be the gift of God, but payment for how good you were or what you did. And Paul makes that argument completely clear. And you guys, this should just let us sit back and take a deep breath of the grace of God. You know, if you weren't, if you weren't good enough of your own to be saved, you might not be good enough now to all of a sudden maintain your salvation. Um, because in that justification, um, as we just bring it down to the bare bones, we'll get to the sanctification later. But justification, just as I'd never sinned, it has everything to do with what Jesus did and nothing to do with what you did. And that is the foundation of our salvation, that in Christ alone. And if you haven't been there, or you're still trying to wait to get that haircut just right so you look like a Christian, or you stop this or, or get right with that before you come to him, you're missing out because you won't 
be good enough. Galatians says that if there was a law that could be given, that could bring life, Paul says, surely it would have been given. But since it can't be, Jesus says, come. And if you're a believer and you've wandered away and you're trying to get it right before you plug back in or, and jump, jump back on walking with the Lord, you're not going to be good enough. Now, we have works that please righteous, please the Lord. And the Lord talks about that, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to His mercy. Good works will accompany faith. But at the bare bones, as Paul starts out the foundation of the gospel, it is about Jesus. It's not about us. And so let us be gracious to one another and encourage one another because it is the gift of God and it is for all and to all. And what does he say? He says, believe. Believe and he will drop the gavel and announce I'm giving, it, I'm giving that boy, I'm giving that girl, I'm giving my daughter, my son, righteousness. Because they trusted me. Now David, we come to David in verse 5. Now Abraham and David were probably two of the biggest characters in the Jewish nation at this time. Uh, Moses, obviously a biggie, but really kind of consistently Abraham and David were, were arguably the, the most important people. Abraham being the father of the nation, where God chose to start uh, Israel as a nation. And David, of course, being the great king, and of whom is referred to as the, who would be the one from where the Messiah comes. You know, when they said, well, who, Messiah, whose father is he? David, according to the flesh. It was somebody who was, they were very important. And Paul uses both of them to point out that God, Abraham being justified before the law through faith, and David being justified under the law, still again by grace through faith. In verse 5 it says, But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also described the blessedness of the man whom God imputes righteousness apart from the works from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does, shall not impute sin. Blessed is the man who the Lord doesn't take that impute, that accounting on his account. When you stand before God and he opens up and here's the record, here's an account of sin on your record. David said, man, blessed is the man who the Lord doesn't put that sin, charge that sin to him. This, of course, being from Psalm 32, where David had spent a long, I think it was about a year, where he had not confessed his sin with Bathsheba and the murdering of, his, of her husband. And his bones were drying up, and he just comes before the Lord. And uh, in order to bring that about, the Lord had sent him a prophet, Nathan. And really, through a, another story, showed David his sin. Look, you messed up. And when David was angry at, you know, seeing it from a, a different person's perspective, um, then the Lord said, ah, you know, that's, that's you, David. You messed up. You've done those things. And he broke, and the Lord told him that his, his sin was put away. And it wasn't because David was good enough. It wasn't because he all of a sudden conquered a new kingdom or got out the Bible and read it again. But it was because when he came to understand that he was bankrupt before God, he fell at the Lord's mercy, trusted in whom the Lord was. And God said, all right, I'm going to come on and put that away. And so the Lord brings it out here as an illustration of someone who was under the law who was made to be righteous, whose sin was forgiven by grace through faith. Because according to the law, the justice was death, adultery and murder, a dead man. As we are, we find ourselves under the law, dead people, and we, our only option is to say, God help. And so the Lord says, this is the blessedness 
And so I try not to take that with a, you know, kind of somber or down because God said, this is awesome. This is the exciting part. This is the fact that you can cease from your works to please God. You can rest and trust in Him because He loves you and He's justified you. Verse 9, does the blessedness then come upon the circumcised only? Or upon the uncircumcised also. For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of righteousness, of the faith which he had while he was still uncircumcised. That he might be the father of those who believe. And through, though they are uncircumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but also who walk in the steps of faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So as, as a Jew here, they would have exalted Abraham. He was the one whom circumcision came. And if you wanted to, in their point of view, to, to be right with God, it was something that was going to be necessary to do. And here it sets forth, well, if that's necessary, if the works of the flesh, if it has to be something that you do, how come the, the beginning, the father, the one whom the promise was given, was justified and right with God by faith before he even got circumcised. In fact, it was years before he got circumcised. And he wasn't baptized. He hadn't read his Bible. He hadn't been circumcised. He hadn't kept the Sabbath. He hadn't had regular church attendance. He he didn't have anything. But the Lord promised and he believed. And God said, I am putting that to, your, that to your account, you're righteous. And so here he, he takes away the power of the Jewish argument, the, all of this, you've got to be X, Y, and Z to be right with God, and he puts it down as no. Through David, before the law, Abraham was, 400, according to Galatians, 430 years before the law, and righteous. And so he continues to build the the foundation not only by stating it and proving it, but now for here from the scriptures before the law and through the law that this has been God's plan all along. There's no uh, change. There's no quick, God didn't change his mind, or now, well, the law didn't really work out, now I'm going to do something different. But the whole purpose and the purposes and plan of God come together here. Um. I really think both here and as we continue on through the rest of the chapter 4, we're going to really see the character and the nature of God behind it, which is kind of the most exciting thing to me because not simply that God has done it, but it's the why that makes it so such a blessing to be in Christ, to be a part of a family, to, be, to walk with Him. Because he's not just simply an abstract God who didn't bring down judgment on us, but he is, longs to be that loving father, that one whom Abraham would, would soon be called his friend, that relationship with him and that he longs to have with his creation, that the Lord is going to bring out his heart. In verse 13, for the promise that would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise of no effect. But the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. So here he points out the fact that if it was of the law, faith would be made worthless. It would be all about what you could do. But faith, rather, will establish the law. So we want to make sure we stay on the the correct side. But there in the end, he says that where there is no law, there is no transgression. So another quick definition. Transgression um, 
is basically to, to trespass a known law. Uh, we found out that you could be under sin before and without the law, just nothing else based on your conscience, that you can fall short of the glory of God, that you cannot be right with Him. If you had never had a Bible and you're the guy in the bush, God says, according to your conscience, you're still guilty. But when the law came, trespass came. Just like, you know, if you accidentally walked on someone's piece of property and you didn't know, you're like, hey, man, I, just, I didn't know. I'm still on their property. I was still in the wrong, but I didn't know. The, the transgression is, is like that trespass where you see the sign, keep out, and you walk right through anyways. That is what brought both the wrath and the transgression with the law is that we could clearly see right and wrong, no excuses, and we did it anyways. It's like back in Romans 1, when they clearly understood God and they gave it up and worshiped the creature rather than the creator. Um, and thus brings the wrath of God. Verse 16, Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of him who he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which are not exist as though they did. Who contrary to hope, in hope believed that he might become the father of many nations according to what was spoken. So your, so your descendants shall be. So going back to the promise that was given to Abraham, that, that original faith, that grace that God had given to him, um, God promised and Abraham not, had nothing in his sight or in his eyes that could make him believe that it was going to happen. It says, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. Now, when he first had promised Abraham, we'll get in the text here in a little bit, but when he first promised it to Abraham, Abraham was still able to have kids. Um, in fact, they even wound up trying a few years later and, and wound up with Ishmael. And God says, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, the son that I have promised to you is going to be completely of me. This promise, this fulfillment of the faith, this trust that you have in me, there's not going to be any room for boasting. When I keep my promise to you, it's not going to be because you were good enough, you were strong enough, or you had the right plan devised. It will be completely of the Lord, contrary to hope, contrary to our eyes. How, oh, how that relates to our own salvation as we walk by faith and not by sight. That he might become the father of many nations. Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief and was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God being fully convinced that he had promised, that what he had promised he was able to perform, and therefore it was accounted to him for righteous. That full and complete trust, that is the saving faith that God asks us to have in him. Full and complete trust that what Jesus did for you was enough. That God's grace, his mercy, that price that was paid by his blood was enough. Now to Abraham, God waited. All right, I gave you the original promise, you know, a couple decades before, didn't bring the son, didn't bring the son. And then they got all excited. Well, we need to fulfill God's promise. We need to work. We need to get it done. And then they had Ishmael and God says, nope, that's not right. And he waits until both Sarah's body is completely dead. No way she's having a kid and waits until Abraham's body is completely, as far as um, having a child, is completely dead. No chance in themselves to bring about the promise of God. And then he promises them when nothing that they could see, nothing that they could do could bring about this end. And God said, now I'm going to do it for you. It's all of me. I get all the glory. 
Do you believe me? Do you trust me? And Abraham, without wavering, without thinking, without being able to see anything with his eyes, said, I trust you, God. And of that nature of God, he wants you to understand him as trustworthy. Not with your eyes, not with your experience necessarily of what you can do or muster up, but do you consider God, based on his word, his promise to you, do you count him trustworthy? His nature, his, his character, do you trust in him? Because we've got some hard circumstances, everything from false allegations to difficult times to death to loss, all these things. And do we trust God through that? Contrary to hope, do we trust God through all of these things that he is able? And the Lord brings also in here the resurrection. The one who is able to speak life into those things which are dead. Jesus said, you know, Abraham saw my day and he was glad. Abraham rejoiced in getting to know God and, and seeing his character and seeing his forgiveness. David rejoiced in the Lord, that blessedness. Or as some have wrote, the blessed assurance, just that, that joyful relationship with our loving Father and that he is able to perform it. So fathers... No escaping on Father's Day. A couple things that the scriptures highlight here in Romans about Abraham. That he was the father of faith and that he was the father of circumcision. There is a circumcision that the New Testament does bring out and it's the circumcision of Christ. It's the circumcision of the heart. And that rather than the physical act in the Old Testament, it was a spiritual act in the New Testament, not of ourselves, but it's a working that God does in us as a sign um, of our faith in Him. And you can read more on that in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Um, you know, there's been a number of studies, and there was one that kind of sparked it. It was out of Switzerland about... 15 years or so ago, and they looked at the data of when a father is committed to following the Lord, and uh, what they saw was a clear understanding that if the father even just went to church regularly, that the children, just statistically, it's not cause and effect, but statistically, um, 30 to 40 percent more frequently their children would go on to continue to go to church and to serve the Lord. Um, where the father did not, um, it was down in uh, 3 to 4 percent. Uh, and it really didn't seem to waver so much with how much the, the mother engaged or how much the mom went. And moms, we'll, we'll highlight you on another day. But guys, I just want to encourage you with that, because as they've studied other countries, they find very similar um, findings that where a father is a man of God, where a father is fully engaged in the things of the Lord, it so impacts the children that um, it just really bears itself out. Now, obviously, as they both walk together, both husband and wife, um, God, is, God is faithful in that as well. But fathers, I just want to encourage you this morning to first, as Abraham to be a father of faith. Deuteronomy chapter 6, which I actually want to go back and, and read. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Gives us some instructions. And I'll start in verse 4. So Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 4, and of course, this being the great commandment. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way. When you lie down and when you rise up, 
You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. To be that father of faith, that whether it's at the father-son camp next weekend or as a grandpa or whatever, that you are constantly, not necessarily as a work, but you are constantly engaging them in the things of the Lord. That you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That your faith and your walk with the Lord would be evident to your children when you sit down, when you rise up, when you get up, when you walk. That love of God. You know, the Jews would take it to the level of, of putting a, a box on their forehead with Scripture in it that the Word of God would be on. They, they'd go through a lot of physical and outward signs. But there in Deuteronomy speaks of the heart. Are you a father that shows the faith and that you love the Lord your God from the heart? Man, the Lord is good. Sharing as you walk and as you go, whether you're fishing or you've just experienced the goodness of God in a different way. Making that point to, to share with your children. You know, in Hebrews 1, or chapter 11, verse 1, it says, faith, faith is the substance, substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. In your relationship with your daughter or your son or your grandchildren, can you, are you, will you put forth that, that love, that relationship, that commandment that we have from the Lord to constantly be sharing and showing them the one who is invisible. Not just that is, there is a God, but his character, his nature. Man, he designed that just for you. Isn't that cool? Man, what a good God. He allowed us to go fishing. Man, you know, just over and over. I mean, God will teach you. God will lead you. But being that father of faith, toy, constantly pointing to the things that aren't seen to the one who's not seen by the things that are. Also, to be a father of the circumcision as, as Abraham was and as we are called to be in the New Testament. That cutting away of the things of the flesh, the, the circumcision of Christ. To be a man of conviction. Not just a man of faith and knowing that he's got good God and he loves you and he's blessing you, but a man of conviction. Through our sitcoms and through our culture and all of this, we are being dumbed down into those who just are, everything's relative and we don't really stand for anything. But not only being a man of faith, it's intimately tied as being the man who has that seal of the faith, the circumcision of the heart, and being... Walking that out, being a man of conviction. Do your children know that, well, if all else fails, dad will get it done. He'll say no or he'll say yes. However the Lord would, would play that out for you. But be a man of faith, share it with your children. Be a man of conviction, model it to your children. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27, now the hope. <laughs> now that we've all got that conviction, oh man, I haven't done that, or I haven't done that perfectly. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26 and 27, it clearly states that God has foreordained our times and our dwellings and where we're going to be, our boundaries, etc. You know, you didn't wind up on planet Earth by accident. God's, God's got a plan. He's working it out. Okay, He's decided where you're going to be, where you're going to live. Um, He's planning you in the hopes that you might turn to him and find him. But furthermore, dads, I want to encourage you with this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Right after the verses I've been quoting quite a bit. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Knowing that God's in where we're, uh, where we're living and what we're doing, it says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Fathers, perhaps we've come up a little short, and we haven't done the best job. I know I've got a long list. But God has given you those relationships. God has given you those grandkids, those children. And he said, you were created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
And guess what? He's prepared them for you. He's given you those kids that you should walk in them. There is nobody better than you for that job. Now, with our eyes, we might think that someone can do a better job, but God didn't give them to, to them. He gave them to you so that the glory that he might receive through that, that he went ahead of you and he specially handcrafted that, that work, that relationship, that child for you. So dads, I just want to encourage you that we have this great task that it has an impact, that we can walk in faith and show that to our children. We can be man of, men of conviction. We can do this because God has gone before us. It says just walk in it. By grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's the gift of God. Not of works lest anyone should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And then he went and made good works for us to do specially crafted because we're his masterpiece and he wants to see the glory of God worked out and lived out in your family and in those little guys and gals that he's given to you. So dad, on this Father's Day, just be blessed. Walk that out as God has given that as a special work for you because he's good and he wants you to know that blessedness of forgiveness and to extend that grace and to know that um, walk of faith with him, the one who the one who is good, the one who brings life to the things that are dead. He can gain beauty for ashes, life from death. And he says, man, I got some good works for you. So to finish it off in Romans 4, I might just invite the worship crew back up. Uh, verse 23, now it was not written for their sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised up for our justification. Now, it wasn't given to dads alone or to them alone, but to us to walk these things out. And we praise the Lord, the one who raised up Jesus, who offered him up for our salvation and raised him up for our justification. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, God, that you have rescued us, Lord. For none of us uh, bragged about choosing the lifeguard that swam out to save us. But we're so thankful, Lord, that you came out and did it. God, when we uh, share that love with our children this day and this week going forth and just rejoice in your goodness, that blessedness that you have not put our sins on our account, but you have put them on Jesus Christ and declared us to be righteous and children of God. God, we thank you for that. And may that hope and that love flow out of our life to our children and to our friends and to a lost and dying world. Lord, as we look for, for your soon return, may you keep us till then and may we be found looking for that. In Jesus' name. Amen.